Hello, we are so excited to welcome you to another inspirational and educational episode of Concord Conversations. Concord Conversations is an initiative by Concord Medical Group to educate, empower, and encourage our community about our health so we can all live to our fullest potential. February is heart month. So today we're talking about arrhythmias in rhythms of your heart. Hi, I'm Dr. Katherine Weinberg, Director of the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program at Concord Medical Group, Northwell Health, and we are joined by our outstanding colleagues from Concord Medical Group. I would like to introduce you all to our board-certified cardiologist, Dr. Ashita Devetti and Dr. Andrea Berger. Many in our community have submitted fascinating questions to ask our experts. Remember, we are giving general guidance. If you have a particular question about your health, we'd like to help you. So come in and talk to our exceptional Northwell physicians so we can answer your questions and give your health the attention it deserves. Let's get started. Thank you both for joining us today. Dr. Berger, let's start with something simple. What is an arrhythmia? Is it just a fast heartbeat? An arrhythmia is a rhythm disorder of the heart. Um, a, a normal heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Arrhythmias can be too fast, too slow, or irregular. So normally when you're in sinus rhythm, and we call that normal sinus rhythm, there are the top chambers of the heart and the bottom chambers of the heart. The top of the heart beats once and the bottom of the heart beats once, lub, dub. Arrhythmias can happen when there are extra or premature beats on the top or the bottom of the heart. Um, sometimes the beat can come early, then there's a pause, then there's a strong beat, and you can feel any one of those different phases of a premature beat. Dr. Devetti, is an arrhythmia the same thing as a heart attack? What's the difference? Arrhythmias are more to do with the electrical system of your heart, whereby, you know, it generates the electrical impulse and then your heart responds to that by uh, beating or contracting. Um, on the other hand, a heart attack is mostly related to blockages, uh, related to plaque buildup in the arteries of the heart, whereby the heart does not get enough blood or nutrition. Um, so they're, they're very different, all parts of the, the heart, but very different, um, uh, you know, uh, subsections. Can you tell us what are common types of arrhythmias? As Dr. Berger mentioned, there's the top part of the heart and the bottom, and either of one can be too fast or too slow. Uh, the more common one is the one that comes from the top chamber of the heart, because these are typically the ones that generate the electrical impulse or the heartbeat. And the common ones are atrial fibrillation, uh, which starts from the top left chamber of your heart, a normal beat starts from the top right, and then you can have other variations or cousins or sisters of atrial fibrillation, which uh, we, ca uh, we call an umbrella term called SVT or supraventricular tachycardia. And uh, other common ones are isolated heartbeats where we call it atrial premature contractions, meaning your upper chambers are just randomly beating here and there, and you may feel that as well. Yes, so there's several different types of SVT, a supraventricular tachycardia. Okay, Dr. Berger, how do you diagnose an arrhythmia? The way you diagnose an arrhythmia can be very basic tests, everything from your heart physician or even your primary care physician listening to your heart. They hear something irregular. You may feel when you take your pulse something irregular. Um, you may be alerted by one of your new fancy devices, um, your Apple Watch, or you may be alerted by something that you have a rhythm abnormality. But generally, the physical exam, listening to the heart, um, the electrocardiogram is the standard test um, that we do in our office on every patient that comes in with a suspected arrhythmia. An electrocardiogram, EKG, measures the electrical signals of the heart. Now, as I always tell my patients, in order for us to diagnose and understand an arrhythmia, you have to be having it when you're here. Frequently people say, oh, I've been having uh, flutters of the heart for the past week or the past month, but when they come here, their electrocardiogram is completely normal. So we're unable to, to fully understand what the rhythm abnormality is at that point. So I always say it's kind of like when you take your car to the mechanic and it doesn't make that sound. You're at the heart doctor and you're not having the arrhythmia. In that case, we have to do something called ambulatory monitoring or monitoring at home. 
Um, we have things, we have devices called Holter monitors. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that and event monitors. Event monitors are longer. Um, so Holter monitors are generally 24 to 48 hours. They have wires. Um, um, and the event monitors are more like a sophisticated Band-Aid now that goes, um, goes on, the, on your chest and has a phone to communicate with it and can measure your heart rhythm for one week, two weeks, and up to four weeks. And then your physician can review and go over any, any heart rhythm problems. And with this comes a diary, which is also very important, where you can write down when you're having the symptoms, because the most important thing with heart rhythm abnormalities is to correlate what's going on with your heart at the time that you're having a symptom. Um, Lastly, an echocardiogram is kind of one of the cornerstones of the approach to arrhythmia problems. An echocardiogram is an ultrasound or movie of the heart. Why is this important? Because we wanna make sure, we wanna see if you have any structural problems with your heart, which would increase your chance of having an arrhythmia. And also the prognosis of um, how meaningful to your overall health rhythm problems are is dependent on how strong your heart is. So Dr. Devetti, what is structural abnormalities? Your heart is basically a muscle and, um, you know, the muscle in and of itself can have abnormalities. It could either be too thick. There are some genetic diseases that can impact the muscle of the heart and um, also conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes can also, even COVID can impact the muscle of the heart. And then the other major one is the valves of the heart. They're kind of like the doors in your heart, which make sure the blood is going in the right direction. Uh, one of the more common uh, valve diseases um, is called mitral valve prolapse. And that is often associated with um, abnormal heart rhythms, kind of like blonde hair and blue eyes go together. Uh, mitral valve prolapse is often and associated with atrial arrhythmia. So these are the more common ones. And then um, at times, if you also have blockages in the blood vessels of the heart, um, like uh, we had talked about before, that can also lead to uh, abnormal heart rhythms. How accurate are the Apple Watches or something like a cardiomobile device? Yeah, that's a great question, especially since these days, you know, we do have a lot of patients who are like, well, I was just sitting watching TV and I saw my heart rate was 110. So um, overall, I would say that it correlates pretty well. Studies that have been done, clinical trials, showed that it's about 60 to 70 percent sensitive, meaning correlates with the testing in the office. Having said that, I would say don't 100 percent depend on it because they're not perfect. Uh, they're a good screening tool and a tool which you can use to sort of, uh, you know, raise questions about your health and awareness about your health. But certainly the confirmatory tests have to be done in the office. Dr. Devetti, why is it so important to understand which type of arrhythmia you have? Yeah, so, you know, differentiating between arrhythmias is important because it really impacts the treatment. So if you have um, sort of what we call run-of-the-mill uh, supraventricular tachycardia, meaning the upper chamber is beating very fast, usually we would just want to slow it down. But um, if you have atrial fibrillation, which is a different kind of an atrial arrhythmia, um, you know, the treatment is a little more uh, nuanced because we also need to start you on blood thinners because with atrial fibrillation in certain patients, you can be at risk for developing clots in the heart and those clots can uh, sometimes break off and go to other parts of your body like brain and cause a stroke. So for stroke prevention, um, you know, we do need to put patients on blood thinners and that's sort of where the importance of diagnosing and differentiating between the different kinds of arrhythmias comes in. Dr. Berger, can you tell us about common symptoms of an arrhythmia? Okay, the primary symptom of an arrhythmia is called palpitation. And palpitation is an awareness that something is not right with your heart, either an irregular heartbeat or a strong heartbeat or a skipped heartbeat. Um, people can describe it in usually of one of four ways. Usually they say flutters, they may say flip-flopping, they may say skipped, or they may say strong. I always view it, um, you know, thinking about uh, the old Mickey Mouse cartoons where the heart is literally banging out of the chest, like coming out of the chest. Some people think of it like that. Um, but everyone, I want to stress that everyone is different. Everyone is attuned to their heart rate differently. Um, I may have one patient, they have one premature beat and they notice it. 
Whereas someone with a defibrillator who has a dangerous heart rhythm problem could have a hundred and they sleep through it and the device goes off. So I would say everyone is attuned to their heart rate and to their heart rhythm differently. Also, I want to talk about just um, common associated symptoms, which are lightheadedness, um, feeling faint, shortness of breath, chest pain, and the most extreme is actually passing out, losing consciousness. When do you need to seek immediate attention? When do you need to go to the emergency room or see a doctor right away because of an arrhythmia? If you're feeling lightheaded or feeling that you're about to faint or you faint, then you obviously go to the ER. But those are usually signs that there's not enough blood reaching the brain because your heart is beating too fast or too irregular. That's usually when you want to seek immediate uh, medical attention. Also, I would say, you know, listen to your body if you're having out of the ordinary shortness of breath that's getting worse or if you're having visual changes or, you know, it's associated with uh, chest discomfort, or if your symptoms are progressing and lasting for long periods, uh, you probably want to seek immediate medical care. Yes. So any chest pain, shortness of breath or passing out, go see the doctor right away. Um, okay, Dr. Berger, there is a question that a patient had a little flutter in their chest and they were told they had a premature atrial contraction. What is a premature atrial contraction or a premature ventricular cont contraction and are they dangerous? Okay, so going back to my little lub dub, we have the chambers, the top chambers of the heart and the people who know me know I like models. So we have the top chambers of the heart and the bottom chambers of the heart. So a premature beat would be an extra beat on the top of the chamber of the heart. So lub dub, an extra on the top. On the bottom, lub dub, so generally, uh, generally an isolated beat on either the top chamber or the bottom chamber is usually, you know, relatively harmless and benign. Um, when they start getting grouped together and when they're associated with a weak heart, they start becoming, you know, more serious and potentially even, you know, very dangerous, life-threatening if there's enough on the bottom of the heart. As a general rule, premature beats and rhythm problems on the top of the heart tend to be more benign, um, more of a kind of a, what we call nuisance, but ones on the bottom are the ones that are the serious life-threatening ones. But as I said, generally a, one premature beat on the top of the heart or the bottom of the heart, um, especially in the setting of a normal heart with normal function is not something that is particularly alarming. We do treat these, however, when they interfere with the quality of your life. So some people, as I said, they feel one premature beat and it feels very unsettling and very disturbing to them. And in that case, they can be treated. What are common conditions associated with arrhythmias? Okay, so arrhythmias can be caused by structure with um, heart problems and other non-heart problems. So the heart problems we kind of um, already touched upon, which is atherosclerosis, blockages of the arteries, heart muscle weakness, something called cardiomyopathies, heart muscle weakness, um, valvular abnormalities, problems with the valve. Um, conditions outside the heart, lung problems, sleep apnea is a new, newly uh, recognized um, cause of rhythm problems, thyroid problems, lung problems, infection and inflammation, COVID. COVID can cause rhythm problems. We see this all the time. Um, pregnancy, uh, a topic near and dear to Dr. Weinberg's heart, can cause rhythm abnormalities and a fast rhythm. And then anxiety. Anxiety can, if not the primary cause, can certainly perpetuate and, ex and exacerbate arrhythmias. So if you have one premature beat and you're anxious, you could have two more and you're more anxious. And then you have five more. And something which was one premature beat now becomes an episode. Lastly, one other thing, um, medications. So stimulant medications, um, inhalers, um, some over-the-counter cough and cold medications, and also um, medications for um, things like uh, attention deficit, like Ritalin and things like that. Those, by definition, rev the heart. What are triggers of arrhythmias? Can alcohol or coffee exercise, um, can these trigger, trigger Excuse me, an arrhythmia? And what about sleep apnea? Uh, like Dr. Berger mentioned, anything that kind of revs off your body or stimulates your body, um, you know, increases sort of the adrenaline surge and that adrenaline surge can certainly give rise to these extra heartbeats. So caffeine, alcohol are 
uh, common culprits uh, that can exacerbate uh, heart rhythm abnormalities. And often I'll counsel my patients that, you know, try to cut back on, on the caffeine intake. And a lot of them do find an improvement. Sleep apnea is a condition where your 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 brain's not getting enough oxygen uh, because the you know sort of the airways are not supporting the 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 oxygen from traveling from the the airways into the lungs. But basically, what that does is it puts your body under stress. So kind of like you know when you drink alcohol or caffeine, your body's under stress. Similarly, when it's not getting enough oxygen at night when you're sleeping, uh, your body's also under stress, and that's why it's sort of thought to be related to arrhythmia, especially atrial fibrillation. Can you exercise if you have an arrhythmia? Yes, I generally tell my patients to let the, their body be their guide. Um, so. If, um, if they get to the point where they're having significant symptoms from rhythm problems, either fluttering or feeling near passing out, obviously that's the time to stop exercising. But I usually tell people, especially when they're wearing monitoring devices to do their normal activities. We wanna see what activities are bringing on your rhythm problems. And with the exception of chest pain, shortness of breath, passing out, or feeling like you're gonna pass out, um, you can continue to exercise um, as, as, as desired. Um, in fact, I've seen some patients who monitor their heart rate when they're on um, ellipticals and bikes and they know exactly the heart rate which triggers their rhythm problem. Dr. Berger, do arrhythmias damage your heart? Generally not. Um, it's usually actually the other way around. I mean, usually um, heart muscle weakness is uh, creates arrhythmias. Um, that's usually more common. There is a very uh, rare um, cause. It's called tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So tachycardia is a fast heart rate. Cardiomyopathy is heart muscle weakness. Um, and this is where prolonged periods of very high heart rates can actually lead to heart muscle weakness and damage. But this is very rare. And when normal rhythm is restored frequent, frequently, almost in all cases, the heart function will return to normal. What medications are commonly used for um, an arrhythmia? Basically medications that quote unquote pacify your heart or slow down the heart rate are commonly used. Uh, there's multiple different classes of medications that can do that. Uh, the most common one we usually prescribe are called a beta blockers. Um, and common uh, examples are, uh, you know, metoprolol, propranolol, carvedilol, anything ending with an LOL is usually, um, you know, a beta blocker. Um, the other class, major class is calcium channel blockers like verapamil or diltiazem. And then there's a very uh, subselected uh, group of medications which are used in, in fewer cases because they do have more uh, side effects, but that's only used um, you know, in very advanced cases where we cannot control with just the calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, which are the safer medications. If you go into an SVT, uh, how can you get your heart back into rhythm? What are vagal maneuvers? Yeah, so if your heart's beating consistently uh, at a fast heart rate, Basically, what you want to do is rev down the, you know, the, the rhythm of the heart. Now, everything in your body that you don't think about, like your breathing, your blood pressure, your heart rate, is controlled by your nervous system. Spe specifically, we call it the autonomic nervous system. And that kind of functions in a tight balance between one arm, which raises your blood pressure, raises your heart rate, kind of like when you have an adrenaline surge, um, and the other arm kind of balances it out, kind of like yin, yin and yang, with, with the parasympathetic arm, which relaxes you and calms you down. And this is usually on overdrive when we're sleeping. So any maneuver that raises the pressure in your abdomen, kind of like if you're straining to go uh, uh, to pass a bowel movement, um, you know, those can um, increase the parasympathetic tone and decrease your, your heart rate and calm the heart rate down. So uh, usually, or if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to blow your ears uh, by closing your nose, like you would in a plane to pop your ears, that can, that can also be considered a vagal maneuver. And last but not the least, if you put very hard pressure on both your eyeballs, that can also be considered a vagal maneuver and help with the heart rhythm. Dr. Berger, what is a cardioversion? 
So a cardioversion is a procedure um, where we shock the heart back into normal rhythm. Um, we can also use very, um, very powerful medications to what we call chemically cardiovert. So um, you can either have a chemical, which is medication, or an electrical, which is a shock back into normal rhythm. We generally consider this when the symptoms are severe um, or when the patient becomes what we call hemodynamically unstable, which means the heart rate is so fast that it's not allowing the heart to fill properly. So the heart can't pump properly and therefore they have a low blood pressure. So that's called hemodynamic instability. So when they have hemodynamic instability, we want to get them back into normal rhythm as quickly as possible. We also sometimes do this in the, in the outpatient setting just to get back people into a normal rhythm as well, um, who cannot convert on their own with medication. Okay, Dr. Berger, what is an ablation then? So an ablation is a more invasive procedure um, when frequently we consider when a cardioversion fails or when the rhythm recurs. An ablation is an invasive procedure to interrupt the circuit. A lot of these rhythm problems, it's beyond the scope of this discussion, are due to abnormal um, circuits, electrical circuits within the heart that um, a special doctor called an electrophysiologist who works on the electrical system of the heart can interrupt. And if we interrupt these with an ablation, um, frequently this can be curative in some types of arrhythmias and obviate the need for long-term medications. Speaking about um, medications, what about supplements? There were a lot of questions about supplements, Dr. Devetti. Are any of the supplements helpful? And if so, which ones? The most common and effective one that we do recommend is magnesium. Magnesium overall is um, your heart loves magnesium and it kind of helps to stabilize the heart rhythm. Even when patients are hospitalized, we try to replete the magnesium levels to decrease the recurrence of uh, heart rhythm abnormalities. So that would probably be the, the only one that, that's scientifically effective. There's a question in the chat box. Is atrial fibrillation correlated to a high heart rate? or is it an independent uh, event not correlated to the, heart, to the heart rate? Well, that's a good question um, because uh, I think when the people's heart rates are higher, um, they frequently have high sympathetic tone and that, that people are more likely to go into a heart rhythm abnormality, which is, so you could take something which is a fast, normal sinus tachycardia, and that could develop in, that could go into an atrial fibrillation. That's why we bring the heart rate down with calcium channel blockers and beta blockers to decrease the sympathetic tone on the heart. Um, These medications also suppress premature beats. That's the other way they work because a premature beat can trigger a heart rhythm abnormality. And I found, and I'm sure all of uh, the cardiologists have found that when you lower someone's heart rate, even though these medications are not intended to keep you in normal rhythm, they do because um, you're more, you're less likely to go into a rhythm problem if your heart rate is controlled. There's another question in the chat box. How effective is a cardioversion? That really depends on the patient. I would say that if your heart If you have not been in atrial fibrillation for a long period and your heart is not seeing changes, meaning it hasn't remodeled because of the atrial fibrillation, the success rate is anything between 65 to 70%. Now that success rate does go down when, you know, we see the chambers of the heart get dilated or enlarged because of the atrial fibrillation, or if you have other underlying conditions, there could be genetic conditions or there could be um, you know, blockages in the heart or high blood pressure that are leading to the atrial fibrillation. So we really need to control those factors as well. So the in those cases, it may be anywhere between 50%. Um, I will also say that sometimes you may need more than one cardioversion, um, you know, so it's not, it's not a, one, a one-stop shop and sometimes you just need to uh, repeat that. And okay. last but not the least, your lifestyle matters a lot. So if you're drinking a lot of alcohol and that's causing your atrial fibrillation, if you continue to do that, the success rate is going to be very low. If you have sleep apnea and you're not using your CPAP, again, your success rate falls. 
Great. Dr. Devetti, there was a, another question that we received. Uh, patients stated that they were having a fast heartbeat while they were watching TV. It was racing a mile a minute. Um, the entire episode lasted about an hour and gradually their heart rhythm went back to normal. They had no recurrence, but do they need an evaluation with the cardiologist? Yeah, I think that it's always better to be safe than sorry. That's what I tell my patients. If there's something in your body that feels unusual, always get it checked out. And especially, I think if it lasted an hour, that's that's pretty long for an arrhythmia. So at that point, you know, like Dr. Berger had mentioned, a good idea to get an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of your heart, and a heart monitor just to make sure that we're not missing anything. Great. Okay, Dr. Berger, if you had one action step to improve your health and start today, what would it be? Move more. Um, exercise is the foundation of youth and the basis of health. Okay, Dr. Devetti, what's your answer? I would say adopt a healthy diet. Um, you know, it's it's not about being extreme or giving up certain foods, but just find something that you can do sustainably and in the long run because uh, heart health is really a marathon and not a sprint. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for another inspirational and educational episode of Concord Conversations. A very special thank you to Dr. Devetti and Dr. Berger for joining our conversation. We appreciate their expertise to educate, encourage, and empower our community. As part of the Concord community, we hope you will share in our mission. Please pass along our emails and webinar links to your friends and family. In addition, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We know you have additional questions about your health and we want to help you. So come in and speak to our extraordinary Northwell Health physicians about your health. We care about your health. We care about you. Thank you so much for joining us.